As a deadly EF4 tornado marched towards the small farming community of Rolling Fork, Mississippi, a strange light can be seen orbiting around the vortex. Upon posting the video, speculation immediately began online. Could this potentially have been headlamps to a vehicle lofted by the tornado? Was this some sort of strange camera artifact? What was it? Immediately after the event, a dedicated group of storm chasers, meteorologists, and mechanical engineers took it upon themselves to find out what it would take to loft and maintain a vehicle, as well as try to find clues in the damage left behind by the tornado. It's no secret that tornadoes can move vehicles around. Even a low-end EF1 can lift up a vehicle and drag it around the parking lot. But it takes a strong to violent tornado to really start truly lofting vehicles. And there's a ton of variables that go into it. One is the type of tornado. Is it a small, tight-knit vortex with a lot of upward velocity? Or is it a larger tornado with more horizontal velocity? Then there's also a lot of minute details that go into the actual object being picked up, including the surface area, the weight and weight distribution of the object, where exactly it's located. There's so many factors that go into getting something up and off the ground. It's a actually rather complex process. One classic video from the Pampa, Texas tornado of 1995 shows at least three vehicles being lofted and thrown from the vortex. This tornado was an EF4, similar to the one that hit Rolling Fork, but there's a lot of differences. The Pampa tornado was relatively slow moving and it was one of those really tight knit drill bit type tornadoes. Whereas Rolling Fork was moving 50 to 55 miles per hour and it was a large wide circulation. Other notable videos where vehicles are thrown include Eli Manitoba in 2007, Dallas, Texas in 2012, in mind, these trucks weigh at least 12, pounds empty. and here most recently in 2021 where we had a tornado hurling four wheelers across the interstate. One thing in common with all these videos is the type of tornado that's lofting these objects. They're usually a small, tight-knit vortex that's more like a drill bit than a large wedge. The vehicles get picked up by the intense vertical velocity, then thrown to the edge of the circulation, and then fall down hundreds of feet away. But there's not really a lot of video of the large wedge tornadoes doing this. Now, why is that? We know that large wedge tornadoes, especially the violent EF4 and EF5s, can hurl vehicles potentially sometimes even long distances. One of the answers to this can just simply be it's easier to tell what's being thrown by a smaller tornado. You have less surface area that it's encompassing, you have a very obvious definitive vortex, and those who are close in range to it can pretty easily tell the difference between a sheet metal and a vehicle. When you have these large half mile or mile wide tornadoes, everything just becomes a blur in the gray murky mass surrounding the tornado. It can be difficult to tell the difference between something like a roof, a car, or a tree. All of these variables need to be taken into consideration, but now that we've gone over some of them, let's start diving into the actual case study that we're looking at right now with the Rolling Fork Tornado. Thanks to multiple videos from chasers who were in Rolling Fork at the time of the tornado or just before, we know that unfortunately there were many vehicles out driving around during the time the tornado hit. We also know that the light appears right as the tornado is making its way into the western sides of town. So unfortunately, everything is checking out so far. My friend Ethan Mortieri is a storm chaser and mechanical engineer. He has a channel called June 1st where he goes back and does post analysis damage surveys. He also does really cool things like makes wind tunnels, hurls ice balls, lots of cool stuff and I really recommend going and checking it out. Based on the data points that we have at this time, I asked Ethan if he might be able to go and do some calculations and explain to us the physics behind what it might take to lift and maintain a vehicle in the air. To get a better idea of how a tornado can suspend a vehicle for a sustained period of time, let's take a look into the dynamics that are at play using the evidence from the Rolling Fork event. To start off, let's state some assumptions. The most common vehicle in America is the Ford F-150 and we'll be using that vehicle as our subject vehicle for this analysis. Based on video photogrammetry as well as damage survey data, we were able to get a measurement for the width of the tornado. The external forces that are acting on the vehicle consist of the gravitational force that's pulling it down towards Earth as well as the wind force that is pulling it towards the center and up into the updraft as well. So that's not a purely horizontal or vertical component, but rather a combination of the two. Based on the wind field pulling the vehicle around the tornado, there is an internal centripetal force that is pulling on the vehicle towards the center of rotation. 
We can now break up all of these forces into two main directions, vertical and horizontal. Starting in the horizontal, we are able to get the tangential speed of the vehicle, so the speed of it going around the tornado, based on the circumference, as well as how long it takes for the vehicle to make one complete revolution. From there, we set our centripetal force equal to our horizontal drag equation in order to solve for the wind velocity in the horizontal direction. We use a similar process for the vertical direction, but in this case, we set the gravitational force equal to the vertical drag equation. Now that we have both of our velocities from both the vertical and horizontal directions, we are able to use some trigonometry to get a resultant of around 174 miles per hour. This result goes to show that you do not need the upper echelon of an EF5 tornado in order to suspend large vehicles in flight for sustained periods of time. Now that we know that it is at least possible for a vehicle to be lofted and maintained for some distance with the winds that we have present in the Rolling Fork Tornado, I wanted to ask somebody who is actually truly an expert on the subject itself. Professor Fred Hahn has been studying the effects of tornadoes as well as airborne debris in them for the past two decades. I figured if there was anybody to ask about the subject, it would be him. And he was kind enough to share his thoughts with us on the subject. My, my research in, in tornadoes and, and stuff flying in tornadoes really uh, started with uh, work that I did at Iowa State University with the tornado simulator that we built there. So Dr. Partha Sarkar and I um, built a big tornado simulator there, like with a three uh, three foot diameter vortex. Most of the time when we when we try to make stuff fly from you know stuff that's sitting on the ground, like on the on the ground plane, like a car, uh, mostly it it flips over and it tumbles, but it rarely starts to fly up in the air. Um, and the uh, the types of things that the types of things that we tried to do were, you know, try to try to block block its motion side to side a little bit until the the, ch the air has a chance to kind of pick it up in the air, you know, because I think that, um, you know, from that kind of experimental research, we've we've kind of figured out that there's some pretty special circumstances that have to happen to get something to fly up in the air, you know, when we when we do tests in the tornado simulator and we try to figure out what kind of wind speed does it take to to pop something up in the air, the wind speeds are quite large, 160 mile an hour plus type of wind speeds. But then lots of people say, wait, 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 wait. You know, I've seen a car just doink up in the air at an EF2 or, you know, just pop over the pop over a row of bushes. I think that there's multiple ways that a, that a vehicle can get in the air. Yeah, going to the video that we captured, obviously there's no way to do anything definitive and that's not what we're trying to do here, but what we're trying to establish is, is it possible? Is it possible that a vehicle was lifted up and maintained around the edge of a circulation for, you know, at least half, potentially a full revolution? I think it's entirely possible, uh, you know, whether or not, you know, whether or not we can understand the precise mechanism of what got that up in the air or what got that particular one up in the air because clearly this is a very large very powerful tornado that's a different that's a different question but is it possible i think it's definitely possible the next step in piecing this whole thing together is to actually get on the ground and see if there's evidence is there anything that indicates that vehicles were thrown around in this tornado and not just rolled like they usually do in order to do that i contacted my friend logan Poole. He's a meteorologist at the Jackson National Weather Service, and he's been on the ground just about every day doing damage surveys since the tornado. So as you guys have been out there, we're obviously trying to figure out if there's potential that we captured video of vehicles being lofted. And while it's nearly impossible to determine any specific vehicle, especially being at night and being that there were so many vehicles impacted, but are, are there signs that vehicles could have potentially been lofted well one thing we can say with confidence is that the vast majority of vehicles were not lofted um there was there has been some uh videos or discussions posted around on social media and things like that of certain vehicles like suggest that maybe this particular car was the one that was seeing the video or this car or this truck or whatever and most of those actually we were able to go find and sort of debunk um some of what uh maybe was theories about trying to prove uh, like you mentioned which vehicle was or was not maybe had been thrown. So I guess the best thing to do is, is let's start with what we do know, right? We have seen the videos and we are aware of 
the sort of discussion, I suppose, that's happening right. um, in, in online or in the media space. And, and one thing we do know is that we've seen multiple videos and multiple angles. So we agree with what's been shown and that these don't appear to be some sort of artifact or mirage or illusion. They do appear to be actual objects that for some reason or another appear to be uh, orbiting um, the tornadic circulation, the distance in these videos. And one thing we do know is that it appears to be happening simultaneously with the time uh, that the tornado was moving across the town of Rolling Fork. Um, we know that the majority of vehicles we found, we were able to locate where they came from, and the majority were rolled. You take your phone and you hold it sideways, for example, and you try to flip it over. It's a lot easier to flip your phone, if you will, in the air sideways, long ways, than it is if you try to flip it end over end. If you try to flip it end over end, it's going to sort of rotate off of its axis of rotation. What that means to me is that I notice very readily when a car appears to have been rolled or when it might have been wafted, sometimes based on where the points of indention of the vehicle are. There were a couple of vehicles that I saw that had the trunk area pressed in really far but there wasn't a lot of maybe as much damage near the windows side panels so and and knowing how difficult it is for something to roll end over end that implies that it was either struck by something on the side or that it was lofted and landed on that side uh, because if it was going to roll it would have a tendency to roll uh, in the horizontal motion so we can see that what Professor Han was seeing in his lab studies is actually quite similar to what Logan and his team were finding out in the field. Now, what I want to do next is go ahead and put together a graphic so you can really visualize if this was in fact a vehicle that it picked up and we're learning more and more that it's a very legitimate possibility that it was, what was it like? If we correlate the video to the path of the tornado, we're able to get a pretty good illustration of how everything unfolded. Thankfully, my friend Chris, who is also a storm chaser and mechanical engineer, was able to render out a graphic so we can see in real time what it would have looked like. The measurements used in the graphic were found using Google Earth. The first step was finding Max's exact filming location. Once that spot was found, I was able to line up the path of the tornado with the tree in the foreground and estimate the height as well as location of the vehicle as it circled the tornado. Max was positioned less than a mile south of the tornado. Right at this moment, the tornado crosses onto Carter Bros Road, causing a power flash. The tornado would continue, moving northeast at a blistering 55 miles per hour, heading straight for the town of Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Max and the other storm chasers nearby were safely positioned to the southwest of the tornado, filming it as it moved away from their location. The vehicle in question is first seen on the north side of the tornado. It would then get flung around to the south side, going behind the tornado. The light would re-emerge, but this time it was on the north side, showing that this was unquestionably an object circling the tornado. This right here is the clearest view of the vehicle as it orbits the tornado at a staggering height of 419 feet. The vehicle would once again circle around the tornado, although this time it was losing altitude, vast. Because of the rapid descent of the vehicle, it most likely landed very near to where it was last seen. I've outlined on the map where I think this vehicle ended up. The tornado would continue northeast, impacting the heart of Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Chris also has a YouTube channel called High Risk Chris, and he posts some amazing content on there. After you're done subscribing to Ethan, hop on over and subscribe to Chris as well. So after all of that, where do we stand now? While we were not able to confirm with 100% certainty that the lights in the video are from a vehicle, there are currently no other real theories as to what they could be. Just about every other theory that was thrown out there, such as it being from a spotlight, a camera artifact, a drone, have pretty much been disproven at this point, and right now, all we're left with is vehicle or question mark. 
I wanna thank everybody who collaborated with me on this so very much. There was a lot of information to pour through and very little time as we aren't even a week out from the event yet. I also wanna let you guys know that the ad revenue from the last video and this video will all be going towards Rolling Fork residents. We wanna help them out as much as possible. Um, that night was absolutely horrible. We want to do our best to try and at least give a little bit back. And if you're able to give back monetarily from your own personal pockets, there will be links down in the description to some worthy causes to look into. Thank you all once again so much for watching, and I'll catch you out there on the next one.